Thank you, Sean. If you have your Bibles, would you turn to Luke's Gospel? We're going to be looking at the 23rd chapter in verse 32. I do want to remind you, uh, I will be gone next Sunday, but Sean Ames, our area missionary out of Lynchburg, will be preaching. Please remember, we do have a second offering next week that's going to help uh, defray the cost for our youth and children as they go to camp this summer. So I want to remind you of that. Luke chapter 23. And we're going to begin reading in just a moment in verse 32. You know, everyone is born with a curious nature. It has been said that the child asks on average 73 questions a day. If you're a parent, you probably say they're undershooting that number. But even we as adults ask about 20 questions a day compared to children. That seems like a light number, but in reality, uh, that totals 7,305 questions the average adult asks per year. We're an inquisitive uh, people. In 1996, Garrett Gruner and uh, David Warren developed an answer-focused e-business you may be familiar with called Ask.com. Maybe you have visited that site, but it's an answer engine. And there are 642,857 monthly visitors. That's not hits. Many of these people visited more than once uh, a day. We're an inquisitive people. We ask questions. Some questions are really silly questions that we ask. Renee will get a kick out of this. I was on a mission trip uh, to Mexico one time, and I was uh, traveling with a guy named David Landreth. David was a very funny person. He passed away back in 2015. Um, he either never took Spanish or never did do very well in Spanish. And so he asked a question, como esta el baño? He meant to say, donde esta el baño? Where is the bathroom? Instead, he was going around asking, how is the bathroom? <laughs> Needless to say, they thought he was crazy, and I believe he was. But there are other questions we're asking that are really mundane in nature, like, what are we going to eat tonight in our house? It won't be chicken pot pie. Um, <laughs> or we may ask a friend, what are you doing after church today? Those are questions, but they're really not life-altering questions. What we eat really doesn't matter as long as we eat and what we do. One thing may be good to do. Another may be just as good. But then there are the significant questions that we ask in life. Like when a young man says, will you marry me? And then the woman says, can I marry this guy? <laughs> you know, can I endure this? <laughs> and then there are the questions uh, that come like, uh, do I make this career move that uh, I'm contemplating? Or what about this personal investment? Those are questions that are really on a higher scale than just where are we going to eat or what are we going to do this afternoon. But there's one question that exceeds all other questions in importance. That's because it's an eternal question. And it's this, what must I do to be saved? It's a question that we visited a few weeks ago during our study in Paul's second missionary journey. The Philippian jailer, you may remember when uh, he was saved physically by Paul and Paul's companions turning back and reincarcerating themselves. It was the question that he immediately asked. He, in effect, was saying to Paul and them, I want what you have. It's the spirit of the question after Peter preached at Pentecost when he preached fervently and the power of the Holy Spirit came down upon people and the people asked, what must we do? So as we look at our text this morning, I believe we'll find the answer to this question, what must I do to be saved? Look with me beginning in Luke 23 verse 32. It says, two others, criminals, were also led away to be executed with him. And when they arrived at the place called the skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on the right and one on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them because they do not know what they are doing. And they divided his clothes and cast lots. The people stood watching and even the leaders were scoffing. 
He saved others, let him save himself, if this is God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him. They came offering him sour wine and said, if you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. An inscription was above him, this is the king of the Jews. Then one of the criminals hanging there began to yell insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other answered, rebuking him, don't you even fear God since you're undergoing the same punishment. We're punished justly because we're getting back what we deserve for the things we did. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, truly, I tell you this day, you'll be with me in paradise. Let's pray. Father, as we look to your word today, this question of the ages, what must a person do? to be saved. Lord, there may be some here today, that's the very question that is stirring their minds and their hearts. And we trust and know that it is your spirit that is drawing us to this question today. So God, our study, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. For the next few weeks, we're going to leave our study that we've been going through on Paul's missionary journey. If you've been with us, we finished his second journey and hopefully after uh, Resurrection Day Sunday, we'll move to the third journey and probably will be in there for a number of weeks. But today we do want to look at this all important question that I just mentioned. It's not just a question that the jailer asked a number of years ago, but it's a question, even as I speak at this very moment around the world, people are contemplating. It, it, it is a question of the mind and a question of the heart. And the thought is this, I know that I will come to a physical end in my life. How do I know that my eternity is secure? How do I know that when all is said and done in my life, that I stand in favor with God? This is something that is stirred not from ourselves, but it's from God. In fact, in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 11, it says that God has put eternity in our hearts, that this desire, this thought that we might be eternally secure, that we might be in right standing with God, that we might have the favor with God. It isn't just something that we wake up one morning and contrive in our own thoughts. It is a stirring of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And so to answer this question this morning, we're going to go to the cross because that's where the answer to this question lies. But we're also going to consider this dialogue that we see between Jesus and a criminal in that day. And Jesus enters this dialogue with everything going on around him, all of the ridicule, all of the suffering that's going on. Jesus took time to engage this criminal who was dying. And he gave him words of assurance regarding his eternal state. You know, as we consider this exchange this morning, I want to really note two things as we consider what must I do to be saved. I want to look at this man who actually was granted right standing with God. I want to see what things were not true of him. And then we're going to visit the things that were true. Because if they were not true, then we'll say they're not a common denominator. They're not essential. These things may be good that they be true, but they're not essential to salvation. But finally, we're going to look at the two things that are critical if a person wants to be in favor with God. But before that, there, there are seven sayings, last sayings of Jesus, and two of those are found in our text this morning. And, and before we look at this question that is our prevailing question this morning, I want to look at this first of two sayings when Jesus said, forgive them for they know not what they do. People were reviling him. They were ridiculing him. They were mocking him. And in return, Jesus was speaking but he was not returning their violent words in a way that they would expect. But he was speaking to the father and he was saying, Father, forgive them. If you stop and think about this, this is the God who spoke the world into creation. This is the God who spoke and the seas were calm. This is a guy who is going to speak in, the God who is going to speak in this world into new creation. We're talking about one who is 
was speaking, who is powerful, who was powerful enough not just to remove himself from the cross, but to actually be vindictive toward those who were ridiculing him, yet he speaks words of grace. As we consider what must a person do to be saved, it all begins with the grace of God. We can't even get to the batter's box apart from God's grace to us. Even the fact that we would ask the question, that we would be alert even enough to ask a question, is a gift from God. And so as we look at it today, we think, oh, that these people who were, who were reviling him would have known to whom they were speaking. Oh, that they had an idea of the power and the love of Jesus Christ, but they didn't. But there was one who did, and he was an unlikely person, a criminal. And I want to see three things today that were not true, that were not needed in this situation. This man was declared right with God there on the cross. Three things that this criminal did not need in order to gain right standing with God. And then we'll look at uh, about two or three things that he did need. And the first thing that was not true of him, this man was not baptized. He wasn't baptized. Now follow where we're going. An argument from silence is this. If someone uses an argument of the silence, they're saying, uh, because something was not mentioned, it didn't happen. And the argument of silence can be used in a number of scenarios. For instance, um, this morning when I awakened, there were a list of things that I did. I may go through those things. And if I did not list something, you would say, well, Rick didn't do that today. Or it may have been, for instance, I mentioned, well, I got up and I ate breakfast. I did not mention that I drank decaffeinated coffee. You say, well, that's not real coffee. That's what I'm relegated to. <laughs> now, I may forget to say that. I may forget to say that, but that doesn't mean that it didn't happen. And so an argument of silence can be a flawed argument. But in this case, it's not because common sense shows that Jesus did not baptize this man. It, it didn't happen. It's not described that the scripture is silent about it. But also common sense tells us there is no way that Jesus engaged in a dialogue with this man. Uh, they said, everybody that was crucified them said, okay, you guys, y'all can come down off the cross. Jesus, you can baptize him and then we'll put you back on the cross. It didn't happen. So what does that mean? Baptism is not essential to salvation. This man was not baptized, yet Jesus said, this day you'll be with me in paradise. He was brought to right standing without the act of baptism. Now, there are many people today, they're trusting in their baptism, and that's not right. Is baptism good? It is very good. In fact, it is a first step of obedience, but it is not essential to salvation. Baptism is an outward sign of an inward transformation. I, I am wearing a wedding ring now. This wedding ring did not marry me. It showed that I'm married. I could put on this ring if I were not married and that would not make me married. I could be married and if I worked in a profession where it would be at risk, I could get my ring caught in a machine. I may for a period of time during the day not wear that ring and that ring is not essential to my marriage, but it does express outwardly that I'm married, that I'm married. That's what baptism does. It is important. I would never minimize the importance. And if you're a true believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, the natural step would be to identify with Christ through baptism. For instance, um, you may never preach as I'm preaching today. You may never teach a lesson. But when you stand and you're baptized, you're, you're testifying through your action, you're preaching, I'm a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. So it is a great thing, but it is not essential to salvation. It is a first act of one who is already saved. But I want you to see a second thing that was true of this man. Not only was he not baptized, but he was not a model citizen. All right. He was a criminal. 
if your daughter were to bring him home, you would think, stay away from this guy. You wouldn't want your son to be a friend with this guy. He had a reputation and he had uh, a way about him that was consistent with that reputation. He was wayward. He, he was a rebel. They would say an insurrectionist. He was a law unto himself. He, he was a thief. The, the word carries the idea of both robbing and rebelling. He cared about no one. He, he did not follow the law. And he said of himself, we're punished justly. That's what he told the other criminal. He, he says, I'm guilty. I, I've done wrong. Spiritually speaking, this common criminal was bankrupt. He brought nothing of merit to his conversation with Jesus. He couldn't come with a squeaky clean record. He came to Jesus pleading for mercy, not on the basis of his merit, but on the basis of God's grace. And not only that, and this is important for you and for me, he was separated from God in his sin. You know, many times we'll look and we'll say, well, I'm better than that person who was hanging on the cross there. Or we'll look at a neighbor who's maybe living a life that we think is really an immoral life. And we'll think I'm better than that person. And we'll begin to think that God works on a system of weights and balances, that I'm just okay, that my good works outweigh my bad works and I'm okay with God. That's not true. Uh, because we are guilty of sin and there's only one payment for sin and that was happening right as the two of them were talking when Jesus was dying on the cross and so we see here that this man had nothing of merit that he could bring all he could say is God have mercy on me a sinner do you realize that you also are a sinner you say well I'm not like he is well the scripture says that sin is this, it is missing the mark. And sin can be in an attitude as well as an action. It can be in word, it can be in thought. The Bible says that we've all sinned and we've all fallen short of the glory of God. And we all stand just, in need, just as in need of salvation as did this man hanging on the cross. Listen, no one is so bad that he or she cannot be saved. And no one is so good that he or she does not need to be saved. Every person needs to be saved. Jesus came to save sinners. In Luke 2, 17, he said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. He said, I've not come to call the righteous or the self-righteous, but I've come to call sinners. This man was not a model citizen. But he did not have to be because we're going to see that he knew what he needed to do. But I want you to see a third thing, and this is so important and a key. This man was at the point of death, and he could do nothing for Jesus moving forward. I mean, what did he have? A couple of hours left on the cross? And, and at that point, he couldn't mingle around the crowd. He was hanging on a cross. And this is so key because what could he do? It wasn't only that he had never done anything in the past to merit it, but it was nothing that he could do moving forward to pay it back. In his book, No Wonder They Call Him the Savior, I think Max Lucado reflects on this truth probably better than anyone could. And he says this, and I quote, talking about Jesus saving this criminal. Now, why did Jesus do that? Lucado says. What in the world did Jesus have to gain by giving this desperado a place of honor at the banquet table? What in the world could this chiseling, quizzling, whatever that means, I know it isn't good, ever offer in return? The Samaritan woman, I can understand. She could go into the town and tell the story. Zacchaeus, he had money that he could give. But this guy, what was he going to give moving forward? Nothing. And Lucata adds, that's the point. Your value is inborn. If Jesus Christ saves you, and I pray that he does, it's not based on what you consider your value. It's not based on what your return, quote, unquote, would be. But your value is inborn. 
God loves you. He created you in your image. Through your sin, you have turned from him. But God loves you enough that Jesus died for you to save you. You see, Jesus, Jesus saves us by his grace, not based on our merit. In Romans chapter 4, Paul, who we've studied the last few weeks, said, Now to the one who works, pay is not credited as a gift but as something owed. In other words, he's talking about salvation. If someone thinks, well, I can do this and God is obligated to give me salvation, then, then you're looking at a work, not a gift. But salvation is a gift. God's not a debtor. His grace exceeds not only our sin, but it exceeds our filthy works. So we see what was not needed for this man to be saved. He didn't need to be baptized and it was a good thing because he was hanging on a cross. Is baptism good? Yes, it is. Is it an expected first step of discipleship? Yes, it is. Is it a great witness? Yes, it is. But it is not essential to salvation. We see, secondly, he did not need to be a model citizen and yet he could enter right standing with God. And, and he did not need to promise what he was gonna do in the future Yet he, was gain, he gained right standing with God. Now let's look at what was needed. Look with me here in our text. It says in verse 39, Then one of the criminals, not both of them, but one began to yell insults at Jesus. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. Now at this point on the cross, this guy was just ridiculing Jesus. It had been a long day. I'm sure he thought, well, if... Jesus were going to do this, he would have already done that. And so he was just joining the revilers. He was joining the slanderers. He's saying, if you are, and I really don't think you are, then save yourself and us. But notice the contrast in verse 40. The other one answered and rebuking him said, don't you even fear God since you're undergoing the same punishment. We're punished rightly. We're getting back what we deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. The first thing we see about this second thief, the one who was granted eternal life, is he repented. He repented. And repentance begins by acknowledging, God, I've done wrong. Notice what he said. Don't you understand? We've done wrong. We're here. We've gotten ourselves in this situation. And even though you may not be hanging on a cross, even though you might not be considered a criminal, every one of us stands guilty before God. We're called to acknowledge, God, I'm a sinner. But I want you to see it wasn't just acknowledgement. But there was repentance. And repentance is a change of mind. It's a change of heart, which leads to a change of action. Now, in one of the other Gospels, again, as we look at it, it didn't describe this. In argument from silence, that's where it can fall short. But it said in another gospel earlier in the crucifixion, the time of that, that both criminals were reviling. But throughout the day, this man, we understand, came to the realization he was a sinner. He had a change of mind and a change of heart. And he rebuked the other one. He says, I'm not in your camp anymore. I'm in Jesus' camp. Would you say that today? See, repentance is not only repenting from our attitude toward our own sin, which is essential, but it's repenting of what we believe about the Lord Jesus. And it's this, I, I choose you, Jesus. I, I don't choose the way of the world. I don't choose the way I was going. I choose you. You see, a person cannot go his or her own way and at the same time go Jesus' way. And this man said, I'm with him. He repented. But I want you to see not only he repented, but he went to the right source. Look at verse 42. Then he said, Jesus, remember me. Now here was a man that was hanging on the cross. He knew he was going to die. He knew he would be suffering in extremely in the moments leading up to his death. But he did not call for the temporary mercy of those who had crucified him. He called out to the one who held eternity in his hand. Think about that for a moment. That suffering for those few hours that were left compared to eternity was nothing, was nothing. Do you realize that God created you for eternity? And you're going to spend eternity in one of two places when you die. You'll either spend eternity with God in heaven or you'll spend separated from him 
in a place called hell. This man realized, I believe, because the Holy Spirit was drawing him to the truth that he needed to come to the right person. And the right one was Jesus. And he said, Jesus, remember me. But not only did he come to the right person, but he came to the right person in the right way. He went to the right source in faith. Let's finish out that verse where he says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now, everybody else was reviling him other than the few believers who were there. But this man had a transformation of his mind and heart. And he had faith that Jesus was who he said he was. Most people would have said, I'll believe him if he comes down from the cross. This man says, I believe him because he went to the cross. Do you believe in the one who went to the cross for you today? Would you say, Lord, remember me when, not if? You see, as we look at it, two things were true of this man. He repented and he placed his faith in Jesus Christ. It was enough for this criminal to be saved. And if it's true for him, it's true for us as we're sitting in this place today. If we would repent and believe. When Jesus was beginning his gospel ministry, it's described very early in the gospel of Mark. Jesus said, repent and believe the good news. What is the good news? It's this, that Jesus died as your substitute. I wonder today, would you place your life in faith in his hands? You say, well, that's simple. It's not simple because Jesus is calling you today to turn from a self-centered, self-absorbed life and make Jesus Christ Lord of your life. Repent and believe. That, my friend, is the answer to the age-old question, what must I do to be saved? Let's pray. Father, as we look to your word today, we thank you how in a narrative like this, a real-life dialogue, that there are things that we can glean that are of essential nature to us. Because Lord, it is the question of the ages because it is the question of our eternity. What must a person do to be saved? Lord, if there be any here today who have doubts, I pray, Lord, that your spirit would stir their hearts. If there are any here today who say, I need to repent and believe, Give them the gumption, the unction, Lord, to do that for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Very simple.